Hello. This is the second lecture of our monitors discussion. This lecture will explain several examples. Producer, consumer, dining philosophers, old friends. We will inject a new, very interesting example, but very simple example, alarm clock. And uh, we will meet another uh, old friend again, readers, writers problem, uh, the reader priority version. And then we will talk about a new solution, which was also discussed when we talk about semaphore. It's the take turn version. So in what follows, we always use the whole type monitor in our discussion, unless stated otherwise. Under the whole type monitor, the signaling thread yield the monitor to the released one. The signaling thread would wait somewhere outside of the monitor. And then, will be allowed to enter when the monitor becomes empty later. So let's take a look at the, the first example, producers and the consumers. We have a circular buffer, a pointer in pointing to the first available location for adding new information. And we have an out pointer pointing to the first location where the, a, a consumer can retrieve the information stored there. So this is a bounded buffer. So we're going to write a monitor prop and counts. And we need to have a counter counting how many elements are in the buffer. Pointer in and pointer out are old friends. And we need a buffer of this size. Because if the buffer is full, all producers must wait. On the other hand, if the buffer is empty, all consumers must wait. So the consumer wait until the buffer has something there until full. And the producer wait until the buffer at least has one slot empty. So the producers wait on until empty. We have two public monitor procedures put in order to get uh, to, to put information into the in location. And we have a pro procedure get to retrieve the information stored in the out slot. The initial value of count is of course, zero. So this is a very simple example. For the put, that is the producer's call put to add information X into the current available, first available location. So if the count is equal to size, that means the buffer is four. In this case, this producer wait on the condition variable until empty. But who is going to make this uh, until empty to be released here? The consumer. So when a producer is released because a consumer has retrieved a slot. So that producer is signaled by this consumer and this producer can go. Uh, add information into the buffer and it change the size, uh, change the pointer. And of course, after that, the number of elements in the buffer is increased. Now, don't forget this one. Count equals one means this is the first producer. If this is the first producer, it has the responsibility to signal until four. Because 
there could be some some consumers wait there. When the when the consumer sees or oh, the value of count is zero, which means the buffer is empty. So that consumer wait on condition variable until four. So this first uh, the first producer was signal until four. Now, what if when this first producer adding things, the first one to add information into the buffer signals and there's no consumer there, it's fine because the signal is lost as if it never happens, okay? So this is different from what we have learned in the solution by semaphore. Let's take a look at the get function. Consumers call function get. If the count is zero, which means the buffer is empty, nothing there. As a result, this consumer has nothing to retrieve. So it must wait. When this consumer is released from condition until four, which is signaled by a by a uh, by the first uh, producer here, so this consumer could retrieve the information, advance the counter, uh, advance the out pointer, and decrease the counter. Now, if the new counter is equal to size minus one, it means previously the buffer was full. Therefore, this consumer must signal until empty. If previously the buffer is full, then some producer may be waiting there. As a result, this consumer must signal until empty so that one of the producer could go from here. So this is your first monitor example. As you can see, it looks like much easier than the use of semaphore. Many of you may understand this. Uh, if you understand, the semaphore solution. And that is why monitor has become a very popular mechanism in programming languages. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we all, all examples discussed in this lecture and the next lecture use the whole type. But what if the same program is compiled by using the MESA type, or you did not check the system uh, specification. You think the system is using HOR, but actually the system uses the MESA monitor. What would happen? The previously disclosed uh, producer-consumer problem written that way is incorrect under the MESA type. Let's see why. Suppose we have four producers and uh, one consumer interact with each other and the value variable of count is listed here initially zero. Uh, for simplicity, let's use only buffer size two. That's two slots in the buffer. So process P1 at an item here, counter is one, and uh, process one exit. Then the system allows process two to enter, process two at one item there, making the count two. Well, at this moment, buffer is full. No producer can add anything. If at this moment, uh, process three enters, and want to add a third item there, then P3 will be blocked because the currently the buffer is four. So P3 waits on the condition variable until empty and switched out. Now, because P3 is waiting and no more executing in the monitor, the monitor is empty. As a result, 
the monitor mechanism could allow a process to get in. What if at this moment, a consumer wants to take one item out and uh, the uh, monitor allows consumer one to enter. So consumer one takes an item, reducing the counter to one. After taking this item, the buffer is no more empty. As a result, consumer one signals until empty. Hopefully, P3 can go. Now, because this is compiled under the MESA monitor. Under MESA monitor, the one who signals continues to use the monitor. And the release one would just be removed from the waiting set of until empty, move to where? Move to outside of the monitor. And P3 would allow P2 coming in sometime later, but we don't know when. So now after C1 signals until empty, C1 exit. So the monitor becomes empty again. What if currently P4 wants to enter? And uh, P4 is an entering process. P3 is a re-entering process. We really don't know which process could be picked because that is system dependent. So what if in this case, the monitor picks P4 to enter? Now, because currently the count is one, so P4 can add an item there and P4 exit. So keep this in mind, after P4 successively adds an item, count is two. So when P3, uh, after when P3 enters the monitor after P4's exit, P3 actually has no slot to use. Probably P3 just over, overrides a previous slot deposited by P2. Therefore, we have a wrong solution. So this is a warning sign. If you write a monitor program based on the whole type monitor, and then you compile and run this program under the MESA type, it could get a wrong result, just like this. At one, and, oh, at one, the third one is blocked. And then uh, one, re a consumer removes something and signals. But this is a MESA monitor, consumer continue, and P3 is removed from the waiting list of until empty and move somewhere outside of the monitor. So when C1 exit, monitor is empty. The monitor mechanism allows P4, the force producer to coming in. So P4 act an item making the buffer four and then P4 exit. Upon exit, the monitor may allow P3 to come in. But at this moment, there's no empty slot for P3 to add in, to add its own uh, information. So this is a very simple example illustrating a fact that when you want to use monitor, check to see what type of the system supports. You cannot expect a, a whole type monitor program running with the MESA type and it's still correct. So always remember this and uh, uh, check the system specification carefully. So the next one, dining philosophers again. But this time uh, we're going to uh, reintroduce you a solution we discussed on slides 138 to 139. 
This solution was suggested by Dijkstra. This solution requires that a producer can eat only if he can get both chopsticks at the same time. All previous solutions except this one, a producer can get the first one followed by the right one. But in this solution, Dijkstra introduces the concept that a producer must simultaneously get both chopsticks before he can eat. This solution can also be implemented using a monitor very easily. Now let's talk about this solution immediately because you know the solution. And if you forget it, no problem, just get back to the semaphore unit and study uh, slice 138 to 139. Again, under this solution, each philosopher has three states, thinking, hungry, eating. So we introduce one additional state here, hungry. Hungry means a philosopher finishes thinking and before he can eat. And we introduce an array of five condition variables, one for each philosopher. And we have a private procedure can eat. This can eat procedure takes an integer argument, which is a philosopher's number, and determine whether that philosopher can eat or not. So get the chopsticks, put down the chopsticks. Initially, all states of philosophers are thinking. So this part is rather similar to the semaphore uh, version. Now, let's study the can eat procedure. Again, the can eat procedure takes an integer argument, a philosopher number. So the can eat function check to see whether philosopher K can eat. Now, think about this. When philosopher K can eat, of course, philosopher K must be hungry. If philosopher K is eating, he cannot eat again. If, the philosoph if philosopher K is thinking, he's not going to eat. So <clears throat> philosopher K can eat if the state of philosopher K is hungry and its left neighbor and its right neighbor are not eating. Now why? If philosopher K's left neighbor is not eating, it means philosopher K's left shop disk is available. If philosopher K's right neighbor is not eating, it means philosopher K's right shop disk is available. So philosopher K can eat if and only if philosopher K is hungry. His left neighbor and his right neighbor are not eating. As a result, philosopher K's left chopsticks and the right chopsticks are available. In this case, philosopher K can eat. Therefore, we set the state of the philosopher K to eating. And the signals self K, that is allowing philosopher K to go. Now, what if at this moment, philosopher K is not going to eat, well, that's fine. The signal is lost as if it never happens. So we, we write a very, very simple function to test for a condition to see whether that condition is met or not. And this function is designed to be a private one so that outside of the monitor, no threat can use it. So if philosopher K can eat, we make the state of philosopher K to be eating and signal him, allowing him to start eating. So with this function, the get and the put functions are pretty easy. When philosopher I, 
wants to eat. Philosopher I says, I am hungry. And core can eat with its name or its number there to determine whether I can eat. Now, after the execution returns from can eat, if my state has been converted to eat, of course I can eat. But what if the, uh, the state there is not eating? It means I cannot eat, so I wait. I did not get the chopsticks, okay? So here, let me go through it quickly. When philosopher I wants to eat, it set the state to hungry and use the can eat function to check to see whether philosopher I can eat. After returning from uh, can eat function, if the state is not eating, then philosopher I cannot eat, it waits until someone wakes him up. When? When someone puts down his chopsticks. So the one who can wake who can wake up philosopher I would be philosopher I's left neighbor who puts down his right chopsticks. Or philosopher I's right neighbor who puts down his left chopsticks. In that way, philosopher I can go. But the things is a little bit more involved. Now look at this put. When philosopher I finishes eating, it set is a state to thinking. And then cause can eat to determine whether his left neighbor can eat. If his left neighbor can eat, then inside can eat function, his left neighbor will be signaled. In other words, his left neighbor's self, I plus four, mod five will be signaled. Whether his left neighbor is there or not, doesn't matter. If his left neighbor is not there, the signal is lost. And after releasing chops, telling, uh, checking whether his left neighbor can eat or not, philosopher I goes for his right neighbor and does essentially the same thing. So these two example tell us that if you know how to do monitor everything, all the controls and the uh, decision making, uh, put it under a single umbrella with mutual exclusion. So writing programs is usually easier or more structured than the use of semaphores. But I still have questions. When we come up with a solution of the dining philosopher problem, as we mentioned when we studied this problem, the dining philosopher problem was invented to discuss good luck. So now we have a new solution. How about dead luck? Of course, if you study the semaphore, you, you know that luck cannot happen. But with a monitor, always remember can eat function is a private function. Every variables and everything array are protected by mutual exclusion, the natural boundary of a semaphore. So the only place where eating permission is granted is here, the signal. And the philosopher K can eat only if he could get both chopsticks. Remember, we check to see his left chopsticks and his right chopsticks are both available. And then this philosopher K can eat. Therefore, we avoid two nasty conditions. That is, one, a philosopher has one chopstick and wait for the other one, and the circular waiting. But we need to investigate a little bit more. 
Now we said a good solution must be uh, must satisfy mutual exclusion and the progress and the boundary weighting. The progress condition means uh, the whole decision only involve those who are waiting to use. And uh, this decision can be done in finite time. So deciding whether a philosopher can eat only need three, evaluating three logical expressions. So definitely the time for evaluating this condition is finite. So progress condition is met very easily. But how about bounded weighting? <clears throat> By bounded weighting, I mean, is it possible that some philosophers can continue the process thinking, eating, thinking, eating, thinking, eating, at the same time block some other philosophers indefinitely? In other words, find an execution sequence showing that at least one philosopher won't be able to eat every time he's not so lucky. Every time when he wants to eat, he is waiting there forever. Waiting for, uh, waiting on the condition variable self k. So please use an execution sequence to illustrate your point. Then we're going to learn something very interesting. This example is taken from Paul's paper. We mentioned this at the very beginning of the, our first lecture. Let's say we have a set of sleeper threads. Each thread wants to uh, sleep for a while, for several hours, and set an alarm clock to wake them up. Unfortunately, their alarm clock is a little too primitive. Every hour, the alarm clock goes off, but it's not a real alarm. The alarm clock, when the alarm clock goes off, it simply pours some cold water to a sleeper. So that sleeper have to pour, uh, get pour some uh, cold water, wakes up. Immediately, that awakened uh, sleeper wakes up his neighbor. And then check to see, is the time I should go up for to go to work? If it is, this sleeper wakes up. If it's not, well, go back to sleep. Well, you may want to say, this is a very unrealistic example. That's right. But we're going to use this to illustrate a very important concept. So we have a ex an external process, a alarm clock. It, it, it calls a monitor procedure every hour to initiate this waking up operation here. Okay, when it calls, uh, the, the, the clock inside the monitor is increased by one. And then pour cold water to the nearest uh, sleeper. That sleeper wakes up and, uh, and then uh, trusts the, his neighbor and check to see whether is it the time for me to go to work. If not, then sleep again. So let's say we define the monitor we call alarm clock. And we have a condition variable wake and uh, a clock value now initially zero and we have two monitor procedure tick and uh, procedure slumber and tick is every hour is it gets called by an external alarm clock slumber is a sleeper uh, with a value n this value n indicates how many hours the caller is going to sleep. So the tick 
uh, procedure is very simple. Every hour, tickets get is called. So they increase this internal clock by one. Now, plus one becomes a new now. Now, because every hour, it's, it goes off once. So it signals a condition variable weak that pour cold water to a sleeper. So in this case, the tick returns, okay? So increase an hour and uh, uh, signal the first sliver. Now, how do we write a program for slumber? Each slumber has an argument and indicate how many hours this sliver wants to sleep. It has an internal variable, local variable, alarm calls. So when this sleeper calls slumber, he updates time, is now plus a number of hours, and save to its local variable alarm calls. And then check to see whether this is the time for him to get up. If the value of now is less than alarm calls, it means it's not the time for me to sleep. So wait on this condition variable, not to sleep. Well, somehow, if this guy is the nearest sleeper who gets a cold order, he wakes up and then wakes up and try to kick the, his right neighbor, his neighbor, hey, tell him this guy, Wake up, please. And returns, check to see, oh, is the time for me to go to work? If not, sleep again. So this wake dot signal actually wakes up the next sleeper. The next sleeper comes back to see whether it's the time for me to get up. If it's not, sleep again. So look at here. I am one of the sleeper. It's not the time for me to sleep. Then I sleep. When I am up, I signal my next one. And then come back to check whether I must go to work. If not, sleep. So the next one execute its own slumber function and check to see uh, it's the time for me to get up and so on. So as you can see, we have a chain of event. The first sleeper is up, signals to the second, making the second sleeper to be released from the weak condition variable. And then this one wakes up the second one, the third one, the fourth one. In this case, we have a chain event. The first one wakes up the second one or release the second one. The second one release the third one. The third one release the fourth one and so on and so forth. Now, what if the last one is released and that one signal, no problem. If no one is waiting on this condition variable, this signal simply disappear. So this is referred to as cascading release. We do not know how many processes or threads are waiting on a condition variable. We just get up the first one, release the first one, allowing the first one to read the second one, the second one release the uh, third one and so on. Now, did you notice? The signal function is the last statement to be executed in this uh, slumber procedure. So please pause for a while. Hopefully you, you understand this cascading uh, release pattern, how the first one releases the second one, the second one releases the third one and so on. Always keep this in mind. This is a hormone. After I signal the next one, I signal the next one, I yield the monitor. 
allowing the next one to run. So until the mind becomes empty, I may be picked up and return to inside the mind to check for this condition. So please pause. Now let's revisit the reader part version of the reader writer problem. Uh, just a reminder, in this version, it means as long as there are readers reading, reader can read simultaneously and writers must be blocked. Writer, a writer must write in a mutually exclusive way. That is only one writer can write at any time. So the reader priority version means as long as there is a reader reading, the writer waits. So that means the waiter, the writer gives the priority to the reader. So the, the writer could be stopped. But we are going to use uh, a monitor to we're going to write a monitor for this. We still need a reader count reading, counting how many readers are reading. We need two condition variables, okay to read and okay to write. So the condition variable okay to read blocks the reader if they cannot read because a writer is writing. So when a reader comes in, and if that reader sees there is a writer writing, this reader waits on conclusion variable, okay to read. Okay to write blocks writers if they cannot write because a writer is writing or readers are reading. In other words, when a writer coming in and detecting that there is a reader reading or there is a writer writing. This writer cannot continue and must wait on condition variable okay to write. So the monitor is still pretty easy. We have a reader writer monitor reading is reading how many readers are reading. We add one more variable, just like the semaphore version. Readers means the waiting readers. So we distinguish reader into two groups. Reading means those re readers are actually accessing the database. Readers is a number of waiting readers. If some writer is writing, reader must be blocked. So the reader's count is increased. BC is a Boolean variable. Initially is false, meaning no writer is there. So when a writer is writing, that writer set BC to false. And the completion variable okay to read, okay to write are used as what we set. We have four procedures, read, request, read, release, write, request, Right, release. A reader, before it can read, it calls the monitor procedure read request to start reading. After reading, it calls read release to release the permission to read. By the same reason, a writer, before it can write, it calls write request. When this request is granted, this writer can write. After writing, release the permission to write. So that is it. So how do we write a code? For read request, it's obvious. It's a reader priority. If there is a writer writing, this reader waits, of course. Now, because we need to know how many readers are waiting, so we add one to the waiting readers, and then 
wait on the conclusion variable, okay to read. When this reader is released from okay to read, we have one less waiting readers. And then this reader can read. So the number of reading readers is increased by one. Now, if always remember, if a reader can read, all subsequent readers can read. Therefore, this is probably the first reader. So this first reader signals okay to read. So another reader could be released here, and it goes down here and the signals here again, do you see a cascading release pattern? I release the first one, the first one release the second one, the second one goes here and release the third one and so on. So this is a very simple, much easier to understand than the uh, semaphore version. Now, take a look at the read release version, read release. After releasing it, we have one less reading reader. Now, if this is the last one, the last reader calls OK to write dot signal. That is, the last reader yields the monitor to a possible writer. We don't know whether there is a writer there, but we simply put, put it that way. If I am the last reader, Let's do some nice thing. That is allowing a writer to write. So quickly it goes, right? If a writer is writing, this reader must wait. When this reader is released, meaning this reader can read, we have one less waiting readers and then you know, increase the number of reading readers and release the next waiting reader and so on. We have a cascading release here. Now, after reading this reader, I subtract one from reading. And if <clears throat> I am the last one, let's play nicely, allowing a writer to go. If there's no writer waiting on the conclusion variable, okay to write, this signal is lost as if it never happens. So, this is a read part. Now, if you did not catch up nicely, please pause and even rewind, re-listen my explanation until you are sure you have understood everything. Please pause. Now, let's take a look at the write request and write release. <clears throat> when a writer wants to write, it checks to see what does BC mean? Remember, B BC is true if and only if there is a writer writing. BC is false means no writer is writing. So this writer check to see is a writer currently writing or there are reading readers. Remember, this is a reader priority version. As long as there are reading readers, a writer must wait. Of course, a writer must wait if there is a writer writing. So if there is a writer writing or there are readers reading, this writer wait here until he is released, then he can start writing. So before returns, this writer set easy to true. Now upon exit, that is this writer finishes writing, it calls write release. Of course, the first thing to do is setting the busy variable to false indicating no one is writing. Then this writer check to see, are there any waiting readers? Are there any waiting readers? If there are waiting readers, allowing 
the readers to go. So this OK to read dot signal release a reader. And that reader released the second, the third, and so on. Now, if there are no waiting readers, this writer signals OK to write, allowing the next writer to come in. in. So let me quickly go through it. Write request for a writer to check to see if there is a writer writing or there are reading readers. If both con if one of these condi two conditions are true, this writer wait until it is released by someone. Then it could start, right, right. So set these to true. Upon finishing writing, this writer calls write released. So set BC to false and check to see are there any waiting readers? If there are, allow them to go. Otherwise, which means there are no waiting writers, we, we try to release a writer. Now keep this in mind. If there are waiting readers, this signal will release a waiting reader. So this signal always release one because we check this whether there are waiting readers. If there are no waiting readers, this writer allows the next writer to go. But this next writer, next writer may not be there. In that case, the signal statement simply disappear. So please pause and hopefully you understand everything before continue. So once you get to this slide, I hope you have complete, you have understand this solution completely. So this is a summary slide. Read request. So reader only blocks here. There's no place to block reader. And here, this okay to read signal, it generates a cascading release. When a reader, the last reader finishes reading, this last reader play nice and signals this okay to write, hopefully to release a writer. So upon exit, writer, readers, if there are signals okay to read. So this one signal here, it goes down and signal next one, we start a uh, cascading release. Otherwise, this write release simply release a writer. Hopefully you understand this. If you need time, feel free to pause. And then we study the reader writer problem again. Why? Because this reader writer problem provides us with so much interesting ideas and uh, other uh, programming techniques. So let's add a minor modification to the reader's writer problem, the priority version, to make it a bit more realistic. It goes as follows If a writer is waiting, the new reader should yield to a writer. Previously, we don't care. If the writer is there and uh, if there are new readers, the, the writer must be blocked. So upon exit of a reader, if there are waiting writers at let one to go, which we have done it. Now for the writer part, Upon exit, if there are waiting readers, let one go. If there are waiting writers, let one go. We did this, we also did it in the previous uh, version. So what we need to implement is this part. If a writer is waiting, new reader should yield to a writer. In other words, 
if it, for a new reader, it must ensure that no writer is writing. So in this way, the readers and the writers take turns. Hopefully you study this slides carefully before uh, we continue. First of all, let's define a monitor. Now we introduce four variables. Does this look familiar? We use the same thing when we discuss the semaphore version. Number of waiting readers, number of number of waiting readers, number of reading readers. This is for waiting, this is for reading, this is for waiting, writing writers and uh, waiting writers. Now we still use two conclusion variable, okay to read, okay to write. And we still have that for procedure. So what we need to know to do is we need to modify this for procedure so that when the reader coming, coming in, and he finds out there are waiting writers block his himself. So this is what the, a reader must do. Check you see if there are there is a writer writing and there are waiting writers. So previously we used a busy verbal here. We don't have this part. So. If we keep all counters, this condition means if a writer is writing and there are waiting writers, block himself. But the remainder is the same. At one to the waiting readers and block. And then when this reader is released, subtract one from the waiting readers and at one to the reading readers and start the cascading release. Now this is still the same. Um, upon exit, subtract one from the uh, reading readers, and if it's zero, then I am the last reading reader. And then we got a writer, if there is one there. So the only difference is here. Please make sure you understand before you continue. Now, let's take a look at the writer part. This is the same as the writer priority. Previously, we have BC here. Now here, as long as there is a writer writing and there are readers waiting, so the writer wait until it is released. Once it is released, it's set writing to one, indicating I stop write, writing. So the remaining is the same for write release. Once a writer finishes writing, set writing to zero and uh, check to see if there are waiting readers, allow one to go, otherwise allow the writer to go. So the only modification for the reader and the writer request part is the if statement. Hopefully you pause for a while before you understand everything. Okay, welcome back. This is a summary. So remember, if there is a writing writers and there or there are waiting writers, this reader blocks. So here, this signal to okay to read causing, uh, causes a, uh, uh, produces a cascading release. So here, upon exit of the last reader, let's play nice, gives the monitor to a waiting writers. The waiting writers wait here. A writer must wait if there is a writer writing or there are waiting readers. So when a writer finishes writing, set writing to zero, 
and check to see if there are waiting readers allow one to go. So we have a cascading release. Otherwise, allow the writer to go. So here and here, if there are no waiting writers, these two signals are lost. So in this way, we simply force the execution to be readers, writers, readers, writers, and readers, writer, readers, writer, and so on. They take turn. That is reading and writing are taking turns. Hopefully you understand uh, the solution. As you can see, we, if we are able to put every control structure and every variable into a monitor, everything suddenly becomes so easy because we don't need to protect writing, we don't need to protect wires and so on and so forth. So this is the end of our example, but I have an exercise for you. In our previous example, we used two uh, condition variables, okay to read, okay to write. I found a solution in which only one variable, take one condition variable, take turn is used. A reader waits on take turn until there are no waiting writers. And then it waits on take turn again until there's no writer writing. So if a reader can reach here, it means no waiting writers and there is no waiting, and there is no writer writing. So this reader is safe to read. On the other hand, a writer waits on take turn if there are readers reading or a writer writing. So take turn absorbs both jobs of okay to read and okay to write. So a reader or writer signals take turn when they finish reading or writing. Here is the code, the same. And we have take turns. So this is for read. If there are writers waiting, wait. When it's released, check to see if there is a writer writing, wait. And if a reader can pass both weight he can read. So upon exit, subtract one from reading and allow one from take turn to go. Uh, this one is allowed, is released, could be here or here. For the writer, when the writer comes in at one, to the waiting writers, and then if there is a reader reading or there is a writer writing, wait. Upon re released this writer at one to writing. When it's finished writing subtract by one, so it's going to be zero. And the number of waiting writers is also reduced. And then uh, signals take turn. So always remember, we see all of these examples. Upon exit, the signal is the last statement to be executed. So is this solution correct? If you think that this solution is correct, please prove that this solution does implement the requirements correctly, that is taking turns correctly. If you think that this solution is incorrect, then explain what the problems are and the use execution sequences to show that the solution fails to implement taking turns correctly. And then modify the solution to make it working. Uh, this, this question may be a bit challenging, but think about it. It's a good food for thought. So this ends our discussion for lecture two. In the third lecture, 
we will discuss three possible extensions that can be found in some implementation. The empty function, priority weight, and broadcast function, usually also referred to as signal calls. Along with three extensions, we will also mention uh, or discuss some topics uh, regarding monitoring and, and its use. So this lecture is long enough. Let me stop here. Goodbye. See you next time.